Okay, so hello everybody. I am going to do a little lecture on professional responsibility for the California bar exam. And basically what it is, is to focus on essays only. So I went through a lot of the essays that were going to be tested on, and I took out a lot of the key issues that are usually on most of the essays, not all, but most of the essays. And I've made them down into a little format so that I can memorize them for the California bar exam. And usually they always test professional responsibility is what I've been told. So I do make mnemonics. I um, kind of make up my own outline. I've taken other bar prep courses and so forth, but I've kind of condensed it down only to um, what they usually test on for essays for like the past 10 years is kind of what I went through. So I'm going to go ahead and do, um, uh, I'm going to start off with procedure. And I have a mnemonic for this, but not all mnemonics are used. Not everybody uses the mnemonics. Not everybody is going to use the same mnemonics as I do. So I am going to not give you my mnemonic, but I'll tell you the main issues is procedure. Uh, and those have four issues with them, with it. And usually at the beginning of the essays, I saw that a lot of this had to do with procedural issues like reporting ethical violations, jurisdiction, things like that. So I kind of condensed that into four, the main four that I saw. It might not be all of them, but it's the main four that I saw in most of the essays for the California bar exam. After procedure, then I moved on to um, duties of the lawyer. And I narrowed that down to C, 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 C. And I'll let you know what those are. Competence, communication, client property, and confidentiality is what I narrowed those down to for the most part. There's other duties, of course, but these are the ones that um, I saw when I read through all these essays, I saw that were mostly tested and usually the ones that they put on the um, California Bar website um, had most of the four C's. So that's why I kept these. You can't memorize everything, so I'm trying to narrow it down to what I need to know. Next, I went into malpractice. There were a couple essays that had little paragraphs of malpractice, but um, I saw that there was a ABA in California distinction. I guess that's what they were looking for on those. Um, and next I went to fees. There are seven fees that I have written down. I'll give you those in a second. Um, after that, I went to duty of loyalty, and I saw on most of the essays included in the duty of loyalty were the conflicts of interest. So the conflicts were put under, um, under the issue duty of loyalty and then conflicts and the potential actual conflict and all of that I'll go through. And also the types of conflicts like client versus attorney, third party, etc. Um, next, I went into scope of representation. I saw that a lot of the essays had a, a little bit of a, I guess they had a, a header, an issue, bolded scope of representation. And I'll let you know what that is in a second. It's basically what the client, what the client's um, responsibilities are and what the attorney's responsibilities are. And there's no intertwining them. Um, and then I went into roles of prosecutor. I did saw, I did see one or two essays that involved a prosecutor. And when they involve a prosecutor, I know that you have to write the roles of the prosecutor, the duties of the prosecutor, and also as a regular attorney. So I saw that on a couple essays. Then I went to advertising. I was going to put advertising first. Um, I saw advertising as a little issue, so I did put towards the bottom. Um, after advertising, I saw solicitation a couple of times on the essays. And a real important one is zealous representation. Now there's a lot of issues or a lot of little duties for the zealous reputation. I got, I narrowed it down to the most that I the most um, <clears throat> recent essays that I went through, and within the last past ten years, this these are the four issues that I saw for zealous representation that they tested often. And my last one would be withdraw. <clears throat> and this is kind of how I would format when I go into take the bar exam, kind of use this as my guideline. So I have procedure, duties of the lawyer, malpractice fees, duty of loyalty, scope of representation, roles of prosecutor, advertising, solicitation, sales, reputation, and withdrawal. And what I did is I made a, a mnemonic of all of these. So I used P, D, M, F, D, S, R, A, S, Z, W, and I made a mnemonic. And like I said, mnemonics are kind of for you to make up because not everybody's gonna understand mine, but mine is please dad, mom, fine Lisa, Savannah and Sienna zipped willfully. So those are people in my family, kind of how I memorized it. And for procedure, we'll start off there. I did have a little mnemonic there because it was, I, it was hard for me to remem remember these for some reason. So I made up a mnemonic and it's doctor. 
do. And D representing the duty of honesty and integrity. And I did find a lot of essays that um, had actual headers or bolded underlined issues of duty of honesty and integrity. Um, you can look up the rules on your own. There's a lot of different rules. I have a little paragraph here that I memorized because I saw also on a lot of the essays that um, they're not really looking, they're looking for the rule, but they're really looking to see, you know, how do I explain this rule? How do I know I know it as a first time lawyer, I guess is what they're looking for. So I use a lot of shall not, um, shall not. I have a lawyer shall not violate the rule of professional risk conduct or condone others who do. A lawyer should not engage in acts involving moral turpitude of any crime committed anywhere. Um, engage in conduct that adversely reflects on her fitness to practice law. A lawyer should not state or imply they have the ability to influence the government or a government official. Now, those are just some of the rules that I intertwine together. Um, of course, I'll elaborate more when I take the exam, but these were some. I, I kind of took some of these from the actual ones that they put up on the bar website. I guess they call them their model answers. I took a lot of them and I squeezed it into one, duty of honesty and integrity. So that one I saw in a lot of essays. Um, next one would be, so that would be D for doctor and then R is reporting ethical violations, which is also known as whistleblowing. And I know this is important because it is has it has uh, distinctions of ABA and California rules. And I saw a lot on the bar. They like you to just, um, a lot of them say answer according to California and ABA. So I have here my rules for that, but that was my next one. Now let's go to doctor. So J J. For J, I have jurisdiction. Uh, basically, I had that in there because there was a couple of essays that had um, if a lawyer is subject and is subject to discipline in one jurisdiction, and let's say he's licensed in another jurisdiction, what will happen there? So I know that if they're licensed in one jurisdiction, they commit an ethical professional act. It will affect their other jurisdictions and their licensing. So I saw a couple, a little, 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 little paragraphs on those that reflected the essay. So my last one is U, and U is unauthorized practice of law and I saw a lot of this um, important here are distinctions um, of course you cite the rule first and you also have to make sure that you have the attorney looking at all the documents overlooking all the document just because he has a secretary or a clerk um, doesn't mean that he can just overlook these documents and sign them he does need to look them over that's his responsibility or duty as an attorney um, they had disbarred attorneys on there so if an attorney's going to hire a disbarred attorney in California, the lawyer must submit a letter to the state bar if they are working with the disbarred attorney and what that disbarred attorney is actually doing. So, you know, this has to be a distinct a distinction in your um, exam. Also, um, of course, we talk about fee sharing. We'll get to that later, but I put it here. Fee sharing with non-lawyers is prohibited. A lawyer, and then also, most importantly, I have here, a lawyer should not be influenced by a non-lawyer to make lawyer-like decisions. So all decisions must come from the lawyer. Um, he might not, he might have somebody on the side convincing him, but if they're not a lawyer, he cannot use those decisions. So he's got to be influenced by himself only. So those are my procedures. Dr. Jew, duty of honesty, integrity, reporting ethical violations, jurisdiction, unauthorized practice of law. Those are the four that I saw on the majority of the four that I saw on essays. So I took it and narrowed it down to what's on the essays here because there's just so much to memorize. Um, it's, you know, and it's, if you know the little ones, I guess you can elaborate on those. And then it's funny, but as I've been doing these essays, I do the jurisdiction, the procedures, and then things just start flowing in my head. So I, I know that there's more to this and I'll add it to my essay. But at this point, I just want to memorize my most important things that I've seen on the last 10 years of essays. So let's move to, we did procedure. We're going to move the duties of the lawyer, which is CCCC. And I have those as competence. <clears throat> communication, client property, and I saw this one a lot, which was kind of weird because I didn't, we didn't do too much of that in uh, my law school, but I saw client property a lot on the um, essays as an issue and confidentiality, of course. The easy part about this is they're all C's, so if you can just get down that C, 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 you're good, and then you can run with them. These are the duties of the lawyers. Um, competence. I mean, it says, from what I've learned, I've taken a couple of, I've listened to online people and I listen to different, you know, barprep.com and all that stuff. 
But in competence, they say not to start with this on the exam first. So I'm going to start with my procedures first, if there's any, and not competence. They say because competence is going to be intertwined towards like, I guess, the middle or the end. You don't want to just jump off with competence. That's what I've been, you know, I've learned when I read a lot of these exams. So you do want to deal with all of these competence. And competence does have California ABA distinction. Communication does have a California ABA distinction. Um, client property does have a California ABA distinction. And confidentiality also has a California. So um, they do focus a lot on the California distinction. So you must know those. I can run through them really quick here. Um, competence, you know, the lawyer must have the reasonable skill foundation and thoroughness to prepare for a matter that he would have to prepare for their own matters. Um, if the lawyer is not up to skill on a particular case, they may work with another attorney, this is ABA, or bring themselves up to skill within a reasonable time to take the case. In California, a lawyer is subject to discipline for intentionally, recklessly, and continuously rendering incompetent legal aid. So that's the California distinction. If they continue intentionally, recklessly rendering incompetent legal aid, they can be disciplined. Um, communication. Of course, a, a lawyer must effectively communicate with their clients. They must answer proper questions in a, within a reasonable time. Um, you can't wait two months to give them a reply. What I was learned, what I was taught in law school was that um, they say within 24 hours. So that's pretty quick, especially if you're working on multiple cases. So you must get back to them, whether it's an email, a call, or a quick text, as long as you document it. Um, in California, the distinction is requires that attorneys should should know or reasonably know that they do not carry professional liability insurance. This was really big on the on the essays. Um, they need to inform their client and get the client's consent in writing. So in California, that needs to be in writing. If you do not have professional liability insurance, you need to inform your client and get it in writing. Now, client property. Of course, we all know that a lawyer must keep the client funds or property in a separate client fund account, the IOLTA account. In California, though, there's a distinction. A lawyer must preserve the client's records or property for up to five years after the money or property is distributed. So California, they must keep it for five years. Now, we all know if there's a dispute, you got to keep the funds in the account and uh, the client... The way arbitration works is the client can require the attorney to go to arbitration, but the attorney cannot require a client to attend arbitration for the um, funds that are in dispute. So they must leave them in the account, cannot take them out until it is settled. Um, and everybody knows confidentiality. You guys can go through that by yourselves. There's the California ex um, extinction. Remember the exception of the confidentiality, consent, crimes. You know, if an attorney reasonably believes disclosure is necessary to prevent imminent bodily harm, they must reveal this. Um, but in California, as a distinction. This is the main one. You cannot disclose. They, the attorney must, one, make good faith effort to persuade their client not to commit the bad act. And number two, inform the client of their decision to reveal the confidences. Um, you can reveal confidentiality if you're defending yourself, like let's say an attorney is defending themselves in a malpractice case. And that is used in the case they're allowed to reveal. Um, lastly, if it is compelled by law, the confidence must be revealed. So you guys want to go over that stuff. I just kind of did it very vaguely there. Okay, so next we're gonna to move to malpractice. That's a different section. So I have section one, which is procedure, section two, which is duties of the lawyer, and then I go to malpractice. Like I said, I saw a couple of these, of this little issue in some of the um, exams. It wasn't a big issue. It was a paragraph that people mostly wrote on it, but um, I figure if you get that, it's extra points. So there is ABA and California distinction on malpractice. You guys can look that up. And then I move to my fees. And I put a seven by it because it's so, so it was so hard for me to remember all of these fees. So I'm going to do them for you. Um, amount of the fee is my first one. Number two is a fee retainer. And I couldn't get this, so I actually put fee arrangement. This is when they're arranging their fees, the attorney and client. Number three is contingency fees. Number four is referral fees. And then fee splitting. Or sharing, I don't know if people call it fleece splitting, sharing, whatever you want to call it. Number six is gifts. How do gifts intertwine with this? And lastly, disputed fees. I have that on here, although I just discussed it earlier. But you never know, I might forget it on the exam. Because it is time conditions and you're kind of not at home working on it like I do every day. So um, I put in their fee dispute and we already know what that works. So it's very important to talk about amount of the fee. Um, and what I've seen in a lot of the exams is all of these are mentioned. So regardless if it's not in there, I've seen people just mention them and they intertwine in some way. 
So I saw that it wasn't big, huge explanations or analysis. It was a good Iraq on them and the analysis were quite quick and done. Um, so I, I would recommend doing all of these. I, that's why I have them memorized. There's seven of them. Just memorize them, know their laws. Um, all of them have um, ABA California distinction. So that's the most important thing. I think they're looking for that. Make sure you know both your distinctions. Um, that's for the California bar. Uh, and then I go to duty of loyalty. Now, I was always taught in law school that duty of loyalty was always going to be put into the part of the essay where the duties of a, uh, um, a peer, <clears throat> where we have duties of the lawyer. They would put them in there. But then when I went, was going through some of the, you know, it's so funny. You go through the bar exam, actual model answers, and it doesn't always match what you were taught in law school. And you got to kind of do what the bar exam wants you to do. So I learned that the hard way. Um and I went through all these essays and I literally printed them all out and I saw that duty of loyalty was always with conflicts of interest. So when you have the conflicts of interest, of course, based on the facts you're going to do, is it a potential conflict? First, you got to do your rule, basic rule of loyalty and conflicts. And then you do, uh, that I have memorized potential conflicts, actual conflicts. Some people do concurrent conflicts. So I didn't even really see much of that on the exam. So I didn't put it here, but I learned it in law school. And of course, a waiver. There's a California ABA uh, distinction on waiver. And then I go into types of conflicts, which just need to be memorized. There's there's quite a few of them. And they do get a little hairy if you don't know them. So if you go through the exams and read them, you can kind of get an idea of what they mean. So there's a client versus the attorney conflict. And that in, entails a lot. That entails their personal interest, the sexual interest, ABA, and California. I mean, ABA and California distinction on that one. Financial business relations, gifts, book rights, and loan interest fee advances. I think the most one I saw was I saw a few sexual interests, personal interests, definitely. Um, but I saw loan interest fee advances. That was big on a lot of the essays. And that's a California ABA distinction. It basically says in all jurisdictions, if the advance is simply cost and fees for litigation, it is allowed in all jurisdictions. In California, you can have a repayment can be contingent on the positive outcome. That's okay. And if the advance is a loan, it is illegal in almost all jurisdictions. And I just said, California, if the loan is fair and it is in writing, that such will be repaid, it is legal. So those have a lot of different distinctions. And client versus attorney has quite a few of them that I saw mentioned on the essays. And then we have client versus third party. Now, this is basically, I'm sure everybody knows what this is. This is basically like, let's say, um, the attorneys representing representing uh representing daughter but father's in there paying for it father's the one that actually went up to the attorney told him the situation um and father's giving the attorney the the money to pay for this um the attorney attorney's responsibility is to look at his client his client is the actual daughter so you can't use just because someone's funding it the third party um <clears throat> You got it. And also, I guess a lot of these is this, is that the client, a lawyer should not represent a client if the representation may be materially limited unless the lawyer believes that the representation will not have an adverse effect and the client consents after consultation. So, so father pays the attorney to represent his daughter. This is okay as long as the attorney is not influenced by the third party in any way and continues to make reasonable decisions based on professional responsibility. Those reasonable words. Um, let's see what else there. I mean, they're, a lawyer shall not represent, materially limited. Those are all important for all their duties. And so the last one is client versus client. If he has multiple clients, you have to go through those on the exam. If there's multiple clients, he's trying to represent, which I saw in the last past two exams of this. That was quite popular. Now, scope of representation, like I said, was a very small issue, but it came up all the time. So if you want to grab extra points, which you know I'm looking to do, is I would throw that in there because the scope of representation is basically where the client's scope is and what the attorney's scope is. Now, the client has the final authority to make decisions as we refer to settling claims and all that. And I've seen that in there where attorneys actually get a settlement and they take upon it. They, they take upon themselves to go to say yes to this settlement without even getting any you know consultation with their client. And that's not OK because the attorney's only there to make the legal decisions and the tactics of the case. As far as the client, he's making all these other decisions of you know what to do as far as settlements and things like that so you have to put a little paragraph of that if that's going on in the, as part of the issues now the roles of the prosecutor this I learned in law school 
And my law instructor actually said when we were doing PR, he gave us an actual essay where they have thrown this prosecutor stuff in there. And when they throw the prosecutor stuff in there, you must go through the attorney duties and you must go through prosecutor duties. Both is what they're looking for for the bar exam. Um, there are five main ones that I saw. I don't know if you guys want to look those up. I'll go through them real quick. Um, the prosecutor must personally believe that the defendant is likely to be guilty and the belief must be reasonable. If not, must refrain from prosecuting. So reasonable belief, guilty. If not, they must refrain from, pros from prosecuting the defendant. Um, number two, must be sure that the accused has been advised of his right to counsel. Right to counsel is very important. If it's not stated in there, then that's a duty that the prosecutor needs to do. Number three, must make timely disclosure of exculpatory evidence. He must not keep. As soon as he gets it, he must turn it over to the um, to the other counsel and uh, let's say it's exculp, sorry, exculp, exculpatory evidence. So it must be turned over immediately. No hiding, no keeping it. Um, do not subpoena other lawyer for testimony unless there's no alternative. I don't, I don't, I saw this one a few times. So no subpoena other lawyer unless no other alternative. So that's what I have there. Last one. Um, refrain from making extrajudicial comments that have the likelihood to affect the guilt of the accused. I saw this one a lot. Extrajudicial comments. Extrajudicial. Extrajudicial, sorry. Comments based on the case. Okay. So that's the five rules of the press that I saw. There, that I saw mostly tested. It doesn't mean that's all there's going to be on there, but that's what I have. Because like I said, you can't remember everything. And at this point, it's getting more and more so. And then I went to advertising. You guys can look up those rules. They're basic. There is California and ABA distinction, so know those. I'll put that here. And then we have, I like to put these little lines because it tells me where I'm going next, which is solicitation. Solicitation um, wasn't big, but it is on most of the essays, small issue. Um, prospective clients, there are ABA. And California distinctions. You guys can look those up, or you probably already know them. And Dallas representation, like I said, is a big one. And I don't know. In law school, I learned like twenty different different rules for this, or different issues that reflect this. But I went down to the last ten essays and looked. What are they testing? Because I need to know what they're testing at this point. There's just too much to memorize. So number one was fairness to opposing counsel. I saw that a lot. Um, number two was perjured false evidence. That was very important. And there's a distinction there, California and ABA distinction. The third one I saw was illegal acts. That was really important. Engaging in illegal acts. And then trial conduct, how to behave in trial. Those are the four that were the biggest that I saw that came up on essay. So those, you guys can look those up, but those are the four that I saw. With the draw, of course, there's permissive and mandatory withdrawal. I'm sure you guys know what those mean if you've been in law school. But I did see a lot of these at the end. Of course, you got to wrap up your essay. Um, procedural requirements upon termination. I did not learn this. Well, I guess I must have learned it, but it wasn't like a big thing for us to know for our um, essays or final exams. But I'll tell you, it was big on the bar exam. Um, number one is a reasonable, the lawyer must give a reasonable notice client that they are not going to represent them any longer reasonable is important there of course reasonable is our like our keywords everywhere um, they must allow time to find other counsel give them time to find other counsel turn over files promptly and the last one I saw was continue to honor the confidentiality because you'll see in some of the exams they didn't and you got to throw that in there after um, actually upon termination. So that's all of that. Now, like I said, this is not something you want to like absolutely go by, but I'm just letting you know, and I'm doing this for myself too, to show that um, these are the things that were mostly tested on the California bar exam. There's so much, there's so many subjects, so many issues, but I narrowed it down to these. So I hope it's helpful for you guys. If you have any comments or questions, please comment down below. And, uh, Enjoy your bar studying time because it is a journey. Thank you guys.